Welcome, welcome to Every Nation Sunning Hill. And uh, before, before I digress with my own rabbit trails, uh, there's a bit of a change this morning, as you've noticed. We had communicated that we'll be having a special family moment uh, of baby dedications this morning, and we've had to postpone that. Uh, Pastor Temba and Amy are in quarantine. Pastor Temba and Amy and some of our leaders are in quarantine at this point in time, while self quarantine in their homes, because um, uh, uh, is it not Temba, but uh, Pastor Amy tested positive. So, and they're the ones who are going to be administering the baby dedication. So, we didn't want anybody to be impacted by that. So, we had to call families one by one just to communicate our apologies and just to postpone at a later date. Our, your safety is our number one concern. So, and we live in times that are just unpredictable. <laughs> we we're all looking forward to this. People have invited family members. I mean, you guys know baby dedications. It's a big family affair. And uh, with regret, we just had to shift it simply because of just the high risk factor of it all. Amen. Are we together with that? Awesome. So we had to just uh, adjust a bit this morning, and Pastor Temba was meant to share the word this morning, um, and then uh, he called me to just step in uh, because he's at home watching series. Don't tell him I said that, <laughs> but I can tell you there is no Bible that he's reading right now. Actually, I'm recording. I'm recording. Yeah, I'm gonna pay for that. I'm going to pay for that. So, yeah, so please keep them in your prayers. And normally when, um, I mean, it's just, just them. There's also some uh, other leaders that we've come uh, in contact with uh, that are just for safety reasons, just self-quarantining at this point in time. We do live in an unpredicted, uh, unpredictable time right now. So, Lord, we just thank you for accelerated healing um, right now, Lord. We pray for the leaders affected, Lord God, the leaders who came in contact uh, as well with the Malaba household. We pray, Lord God, also for the Malaba household that you'd, you'd bring accelerated healing in Jesus' name. You'd bring rest in Jesus' name. And as they begin to recuperate as a family, Father God, may it just be a smooth, may it just be a couple of days off and having family time. So we just pray for that, Father God. May they enjoy each other's company right now in the next couple of days. And anybody else, Lord God, in this family who has been affected or who is uh, also self-quarantining, Father God, we pray for accelerated healing in their lives and protection over their families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 And that will also give some time for those who, who might have maybe missed the shortlist for baby dedications. Um, you are more than welcome to still add your name um, as well, uh, and at, at a later stage, we'll be, able, we'll be able to communicate to you when the next baby dedication is going to be. Are we good with that? Awesome, 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 awesome. I see that they've, uh, they've written, they've put sellotape here, and it says, quote, Jude, exclamation point, 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 please do not cross this line. And it's also on this side as well. Let's just say I will try. Let's say I will try. I'm one of those. Uh, I don't know what type of Christian you are, but I'm, I'm, I'm this type of Christian. <laughs> I live by a wish factor. Like I wish you would try. So actually I'm going to try my best uh, to keep it in line. And for the reason that we're also recording as well. Uh, as we continue with our hybrid, our hybrid format and accommodating for people who are watching at home. Awesome. And for those who are watching at home as well, please feel free to click onto our connection line. We would love to get to know more about you and more about your experience this morning with us. Who's been enjoying the, the forgiveness uh, series that we've been running? Lies. I have not been enjoying because it means you have to forgive. I miss the top 40 hits like victory, you know, like there's a, uh, uh, God is going to prosper you. I miss that stuff. The stuff where you have to forgive is a bit hard. <laughs> it's a bit hard because God starts tickling those little strings in your soul that have been hidden there. So uh, uh, as a leadership as well, we've been experiencing that in our staff meetings. 
We've been experiencing that theme quite a lot. But even with that said, consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Amen. So today we're going to be talking about one of my, one of my favorite characters in the Bible is Joseph. Joseph had a hard life, guys. If there's anybody who, had, who struggled with forgiveness, ah, well, especially when it comes to family, yeah, it's, I'm that type of person. If I was Joseph, you are fresh out of luck with me. I'm, I'm, you know? So we're going to go into that. But before we do, before we do, we are made in the image of God. We are made in the image of God. So a lot of times when God is bestowing a certain uh, um, an attribute to us or even an identity, it comes from the fact that we are made in his image. And he empowers us when we are made in his image to make sure that we are able to fulfill what he has called us to do. God has an insatiable appetite for what we call other people. So it's near impossible for you to say that you love God and hate his people. Those two things do not go together. To a point where he even rigged the system that he gave his most prized possession for a chance that you might reconcile with him. One of the things I struggle with, we throw this in Christian circles a lot, is be like Christ. Be like Christ. And I've been guilty of taking aspects of that statement for my benefit. When I want victory, be like Christ. When I want a door to open in my work, be like Christ. If I'm trusting for something in my, be like Christ. If there's, a, if there's a relational thing that I need to work on, tell myself, be like Christ. The tricky thing about being like Christ, that's an identity-based issue. So for me personally, I came through the door. I came through the door of my relationship with Christ through forgiveness. I have felt that I am never more like Christ than when I am forgiving. That's the door I came in. I don't know what door you came in. So when somebody says, have you ever heard the statement that says, do you know how it feels like to be in his shoes? I want you to think of that when it says be like Christ. And whenever I am forgiving, I, or I'm, I'm, placed in a, I'm put in a place where I have to forgive something or someone, I'm like, yo, Jesus, man, being like you is, yo, hi, man, is this what it means to be like you? It's not romantic anymore now. I'm like, yo, Lord, I need help. Being like you is rough, man. It is rough. It means I just have to let things go. I have to forgive. And you know what that does for me? Apart from the fact that it heals and releases me, when I get to see how it is to be and walk in, in Christ's shoes, I am drawn closer to him. The outcome is not that forgiveness comes or people are released. That's great. The most important thing for him is that me and him draw closer together. Just like me, if I say, hey, if I say to Atle, do you know what it feels like to be in my shoes? Come spend some time with me. Come spend a day in the life of Mam Lapo and get to feel how it is to be her. If I do that for a week and attend all the meetings she attends and do all the stuff that she has to do, afterwards I will be drawn, me and her will become closer because I'll get to understand what it means to be like her. You get what I'm saying? Now when it comes to forgiveness, forgiveness is an identity issue. It's an identity issue. Now you ask, Jude, have you forgiven? Maybe I have, maybe not. The right question to ask is, are you forgiving? Forgiven is an event-based act. When I say, have you forgiven, you are thinking of something that happened, and now we're thinking, have you get, gotten over it? Have you forgiven? But see, that's an event-based act. When I say, are you forgiving, this is an identity-based question. Are you a forgiving person? If you spend most of your time having forgiven, situation per situation, you will struggle going through this life. But your core identity is that you are a forgiving person. That is the core of your identity. 
because Jesus is a forgiving person. You cannot walk in your identity outside of that. You cannot say that I'm not going to forgive and say you're walking in the identity of Christ. Whether we like it or not, part of our makeup, it's near close to it being part of, it's like a leg. <laughs> it's like an arm. You are forgiving whether you like it or not. Amen? Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is thy kingdom, thy power and thy glory forever and ever. Amen. Have you forgiven event-based? Are you forgiving? That's a lifestyle. That is a lifestyle. When you have the identity, when you begin to walk in the kingdom and you begin to have a relationship with Christ, let's just be honest, people. A lot of the stuff sounds too good to be true. It really is. A lot of the stuff sounds way too good to be true. For example, even here, when you walk, so I'm the type of person who, I figured, you know what, if I'm going to live this life, let me live it to the fullest. Like, I don't want to live a half Christian life. Think about what you are giving up just to sit here. It's a lot. <laughs> For you to come here and do this 50-50, like, it's a lot. <laughs> the things that the heaven is requesting of you to do, it's a lot. For you to be half-hearted and walk with Christ and not be fully in this, it's, it, it's a lot. It, it becomes such an obligation that you can't even execute certain things. Things are way too good to be true. We are compelled to believe in things that are too good to be true. You cannot, you cannot look to the wisdom of this world to, to explain the wisdom of heaven. It's just impossible. That's why some of you, when you share some of the stuff you're going through with your friends who are unbelievers, they'll be like, ah, are you sure? You waiting on what? Are you sure? Some of the stuff is, is you can't even repeat it. <laughs> you can't even repeat it in public. There are many times where common sense and general knowledge just do not match up to the promise of the kingdom. It's just too good to be true. One of my friends made a joke at me when I was walking with my, my wife. He came to me and said, Bro, I don't know how you got, and I know some of you think it, it's okay, let's just take it out there. I don't know how you got a wife like that. I just don't know. And my thing has always been this. <laughs> you don't, I don't, I won't regret what has not happened. And um, I won't regret what has not happened. And I'm always, I always have a desire for things I don't deserve. You just have to have an appetite for things you don't deserve. It's just what it is. Things have never made sense for me. I remember when I was pursuing my wife, I was, a, I was a missionary for about two years. I was earning 900 rand a month. My wife was like in the worship team, worship leader, disciple maker, what, 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 all of that double degree. Somebody even came to me and said, you don't even go there. That's Dean's List material. You, you are not even gonna, you are wasting her time. That girl is serious. Don't even try anything. This is like one of the people who are discipling her. Don't even go there. You're wasting her time. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want. <laughs> I figured <laughs> I can't lose what I don't have, and I can't regret what has never happened. I've always had an appetite for things I don't deserve. Simply because if I'm going to live this Christian life, there has to be things where I'm worshiping God that I did not make come true. When you walk around this church, there are some people as well. Guys, I'm telling you, I think the church, this church has an anointing on the women that come here. Also, there will be times where I'm speaking to certain leaders. I'll be speaking to, yeah, because they're not here. I'll be speaking to Kaya, and I look at Sisla, I'm like, how did you? 
you, how did you land? Then you'd be in conversations with Bob Babu Tumisa, and then you look at Lapo, and you like, Babu Tumisa, hey, how did you get a wife? Like, how did, and then you'll speak, you look at Bob Tumisa, and then you look at Fine. Like, Fine, how did you get, you know, and then you hear the wisdom of grace, and then you look at Richard. <laughs> And Richard, how, how did you get a wife like Grace? Like, how did you, they, we know about getting things we don't deserve. If you try to justify things that you're going to get in the kingdom and try to use your earthly wisdom to justify these things, they will not make sense. You are not built for this world. If you cannot be satisfied by things in this world, it just means you are not from it. You are called to come and influence it. Now let's talk about forgiveness. Forgiveness is too good to be true. Because you're basically telling me that somebody came and wiped my slate clean. Not that I would follow them. For a chance that I would follow them. Because remember, it's still my choice, right? They didn't do it for me, so like, so now I'm forced now. I'm a slave to the... No, no, no. For a chance that I would follow them. That's what forgiveness... That's when Jesus came. That's what basically he, he was saying to us. In Genesis chapter 37, we look at the life of Joseph. And shame. Joseph really had it rough. Joseph had it rough. And I think also Joseph was a bit premature. In English they say it's called premature ambition of, or delusions of grandeur. In Vanak it's Ebe Papa. He was papering. He was forward. How you give us tacharach. How you gonna have a dream where everyone bows down to you and then you come tell the same people who are way older than you, that by the way, one day you're all going to bow down to me. I think Joseph should have read the room, in my honest opinion. <laughs> Joseph was highly favored by his father, Jacob. Joseph had four levels of betrayal that he had to go through. The first one was family in Genesis 37. The betrayal of family. Jealous brothers sold into slavery, sold to the Midianites, and then sold to the Ishmaelites, and then sold into Egypt as a slave. The second one was the betrayal of an employer. We're going to get into that. The betrayal of an employer. The third one was the betrayal of friends. Friends who were in the same barracks and hardcore and, 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 and hardships that they were going through. D betrayed by friends. And the last one, number four, was he was betrayed by, he was betrayed by a different ethnic group. It is unheard of prior to that that a non-Egyptian would become the governor of Egypt. When you sold into slavery, it's because you come from a lesser, people see you as lesser. So he had to give up who he was and almost take on the identity of an Egyptian because he wouldn't be accepted either way. In Genesis chapter 37, it's now, verse 19 says, Here comes the dreamer, they said to each other. These are the brothers. This is the first betrayal of family. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we will see what comes of his dreams. When Reuben heard this, he tried to rescue him from their hands. Let's not take his life, he said. Don't shed any blood. Throw him into the cistern here in the wilderness, but don't lay a hand on him. Reuben said this to rescue him from them and take him back to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the, orn the ornate robe he was wearing, and they took him and threw him into the cistern. The cistern was empty, and there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Galid. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. 
the first betrayal, and we dealt with this in the first couple of weeks where he was betrayed, where he was betrayed by family. Some of you know that you have people in your life that are dysfunctional. When you know that you have people in your life or family members that are dysfunctional, for you to be a forgiving person automatically means that you are the most intelligently, the most emotionally intelligent person within that interaction. So some of you know that some of your family members maybe do not hold to what the gospel of Jesus says. Or some of them just have habitual spirits that hold on to them for them to keep repeating certain habits. So when you come into a relationship with certain people, when we say let them go and forgive, when you know someone is going to behave in a particular way because they don't hold the standard of the, of the word, you cannot hold that against them. You, unf you can't because they don't hold up to the same biblical standard that you are walking on. You are the most emotionally intelligent person in that relationship. The reason why Jesus could forgive and uh, walk around and forgive people is because he knew when you become a forgiving person, you are familiar with what world you are in. You know that you live around imperfect people. You know that if you don't put that dish right, your mother-in-law is going to say something. Don't be shocked. Why are you shocked? That's who she is. Adjust accordingly. You know when you enter a particular mall, there's a security guard who likes doing a power play by being a tough guy. Why are you getting involved? <laughs> you are the most emotionally mature person in that scenario. The fact that you can say, ah, these guys just love throwing their power around. You are intelligent enough. Let it go. Forgive. When you know your employer is going to manifest... <laughs> Why are you shocked? And then you run back to God and say, look, what is, look at what they're doing to me. They don't understand. They do you are the most emotionally mature person in this interaction. Forgive, adjust accordingly. Jesus is not shocked by the things you do. Do you know that? Because he, know he, he knows who he fell in love with. Now let's not even get into marriage. Forgiveness, Genesis 39, forgiveness of employers. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. But he refused. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You know what I love about people who walk in the will of God? They, they're not accountable to the systems of the world that, that also hold them accountable. They, they are held accountable to God. They, I'm not going to do that. I know my employer, there are rules that my employer has placed in. But I'm not doing it so my employer doesn't catch me. I'm doing it because God is watching me. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came in. Then he told, his, he told him the story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story, his wife told him, this is how your slave treated me. He burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. The betrayal, the betrayal of an employer. <laughs> And a lot of us are in the working space. A lot of us are in the working space right now. And a lot of you have experienced this type of betrayal. And also, I want to bring it to you that when you begin to bring healing or bring forgiveness into the space, it's important to align yourself with your identity in why God has placed you there. You are not in that company by chance. There was a time the job you have was a prayer item. You are not working in that particular company by chance. A lot of times we get so consumed with what the people around us are doing that we forget that we are meant to be agents of change within that scenario. Your, your, your
colleagues, your work starts at 8 o'clock, but your colleagues tend to come between 8.15 and 8.30. And then you start saying, ah, but everybody else comes at 8.30. So, ah, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to be there on time at 8 o'clock. But who are you working for? Are you working for your employer or are you working for the one true God who gave you that job? Sometimes we wonder why unbelievers, sometimes we wonder why unbelievers don't take us seriously. <laughs> because even in some of the entry level responsibilities that God has given us, we tend to be very wishy washy about them. Joseph, Joseph was known, he got to a level in Potiphar's household that he was denied nothing. He was denied nothing except for Potiphar's wife. He was given that responsibility. What responsibilities has God given you? Have you gotten to a point where you feel like you've been taken so advantage of in your workspace that you're like, you know what, I'm just going to give them, I'm the only one here who works hard. Everyone here sends in their deliverables late. I'm the only one who is always on time. I'm going to stop doing that now. I'm just going to give them a little of my energy because if I give them more, they start taking advantage. You are not of that company. You are called there to make a change. Mm -hmm. So when you give what is required, we can't clap for you because it's required. <laughs> As a kingdom believer, you're meant to give more than what is required. The third betrayal was the forgiveness of friends in Genesis, Genesis 40. The cup bearer and the baker. Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master. And the king of Egypt, the, sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with these two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended to them. The chief cup bearer, however, did not remember Joseph. This is later on in verse 23. The chief cup bearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This is after they were released from prison. The cup bearer and the baker, th this is a particular relationship. These guys were all in prison together to a point where even Joseph served them because it says the scripture that he also attended to them. Have you ever been in a relationship with certain friends that sometimes you guys were so close that even your prayer lists were the same? And you were betrayed by them. Like, you knew what I was trusting God for. You knew what, what, what hurt I had come through. You knew my life story, but you still chose to betray me. You knew that you and I were struggling. We were in the trenches together. When you said this about my wife, or when you said this about my husband, or when you said this about my child, you and I come from the same place. How could you say that? You and I come from the same town. How could you say that? The worst betrayal, I think, comes from the people you were once close with. Because they knew exactly at that point in time where you were. They knew, and sometimes you think that they knew how to hurt you. And Joseph was like, hey, bro, just when you get up there, remember me. And they totally forgot interpreted their dreams, helped them. He even gave one a warning that, yo, your head's going to show up on a plate if you don't come right. And he did. But Joseph was still stuck in that prison. Now, my question I have for you is, do you think that it was God's purpose for Joseph to be in that prison? God could have released Joseph at any given point in time. I guess the more hurting question is where you are right now, why doesn't God take you out of there? That's the question we really want to ask. But in every theme of Joseph's life, wherever he was degraded or promoted or demoted, or he always had a theme. He always had a theme where people in authority trusted him. Pay attention to the themes of what God is doing in your life. God, has no, God is no respecter of promotion, demotion. Some of you started off in awesome companies. Now you're working at a company where you're like, ah, I'm smarter than everyone here. Why am I here? Is this a spiritual attack? 
is the devil doing things? Can we stop and just, uh, what is God doing in the broader picture of your life? The reason why Joseph, the reason why God had, a, uh, had this intricate plan for Joseph, the end goal of whatever is going on with Joseph is the fact that the people of God need to be saved at the end of the day. That's the whole underlining theme here. The people of God need to be saved at the end of the day. If it requires you to be in prison for two years, then that's what it takes. I'm trying to build a people here. I'm trying to build a people here. And yes, I know about the kingdom you're trying to do personally in your own life, but I'm more about the bigger picture. The last one, the last betrayal is the forgiveness of different ethnic groups. This is a bit of a touchy topic. Because if Joseph being an Israelite, being sold into slavery, first of all, he was moved from Ishmaelites, second, uh, taken by the Midianites, then taken into Egypt to be a slave. Um, I mean, and I guess to some degree, apart from maybe the movies we've all watched, but we all know that generally that the identities of a slave in certain cultures are you are the lowest of the low. So Joseph had every reason, every reason to hate Egyptians. Every reason. I mean, Moses struggled with the same thing, if, you, if, you, if you're familiar with the biblical narrative. Moses struggled with the same thing. He had every reason in him to hate Egyptians. Or to even hate the Egyptian, to even hate the Egyptian system. But it's strange because the Egyptian system is what saved the people of God at a later stage. We'll get into that. One of the questions that we, were, we had to deal with at Connect Group one time was a, was a bit of a touchy one, and we kind of left it on the shelf. So I'm going to throw it at you. <laughs> in numerous times when you face, when you're in South Africa, you face quite a lot of prejudice, um, um, especially because of the history that we, as, as South Africans, or even whether it be black, white, or people of color, we have basically a touchy relationship amongst each other simply because of the history we come from. Then now we become believers. Pastor Roger Pierce, one of our, um, our spiritual fathers, every nation, Southern Africa, um, he once ran a, wrote a book called Better Together. And one of those, one of the themes from those books, they were running a series at Every Nation Rosebank where they, they had people coming in from the past apartheid system to come into church and basically tell of the things they used to do, who are now believers tell other things they, need, uh, uh, they were doing, what they were involved in, and also just to create an atmosphere of forgiveness. And one of them, one of those guys, I, I, I stand to be corrected, I forgot his name, but I was in that session, he was one of the head of police, head of police within the apartheid system back in the day, and he came on stage, who's now a full out, spirit filled believer. And he said some things that, you know, that, that left a lot of people, not that he meant to offend, but he was basically being honest and saying, this is what we did because we didn't know the power of the Holy Spirit. We didn't know the power of God. These are the atrocities that we were responsible for because of, what, because of how deceived we were. And three of my friends walked out of the auditorium. <laughs> walked out of the auditorium because they're like, we're not going to listen to this. And unfortunately, those friends of mine were also either in leadership or in uh, ministry of some kind. And the question arose, and the question arose, that the question that came out was this. Am I black first, then I'm a Christian? Or am I a Christian, then I'm black? Yeah, I let that marinate for a bit. Because we are, we are here to reconcile with each other. My white friends as well in ministry school had to ask themselves the question, am I white first, then I'm a Christian, or am I a Christian, then I'm white? Because if I have to separate this, the, the identity that I have on earth, my spirit was made first before my skin color was. And if I'm a believer, God has, has a plan for this country, has a plan for this nation, and he's put me in here to be a reconciler of people. But let me be honest with you. There are times where I feel like, hey, I'm black first. And I've had to repent. <laughs> and then the question is, can you be both? <laughs> can you be both? And I believe you can, but there are times where your earthly identity, when it raises itself up 
unto the, upon or even over the knowledge of who Christ is, it has to be laid down. Yes, I know it's a tough one to swallow. Me and my wife are still having this debate even in our home right now. <laughs> God has called us to reconcile. That means that me, as a new believer in Christ, living in South Africa, if all my friends look like me, there's a problem. That's what it basically means. Because God has called me to reconcile with other nations, to reconcile with people of different ethnic groups, to reconcile with people of different color. If, I, if you arrive in heaven, guys, and everyone looks like you, you might be in the wrong place. <laughs> and that is something that I'm still struggling with in my soul. And, and you know what? And God, is, God has given me grace for that. But he still wants me to have the conversation with him and not run from it. What are you choosing to be? What are you choosing to be? It's not a matter of what you have to do. Who do you need to be for the kingdom to spread in your society? That means I need to let go of offense when I enter certain circles. I've had to learn to read the room. We were challenged with this. I've had to learn to read the room. When I joined a CrossFit club where I was the only black person there, and the certain things that were, were said that, that I really got offended, God will ask me, why are you here? Are you here to reconcile or are you here to protect yourself? No, Lord, I'm here to reconcile. Then let me protect you. Go spread the kingdom. You do not have the luxury, as a son, you do not have the luxury to be offended. You've lost that. So either you work for me or you work with me. When you enter certain working environments and people still have an old system of thinking, you need to ask yourself, are you there? And I am touching buttons. Let me touch those buttons. Are you there to progress black people? in places where they were not there before. Because we all run to that, that, the struggle, right? Are you there to progress black people or are you there to advance the kingdom of God so that environment can be pleasing to God? Are you there to advance white people? Are you there to advance Indian people, whatever your ethnicity is? Are you there to advance people from Limpopo? Oh, I'm sorry, I had to, I'm sorry, I had to. I couldn't resist. I couldn't resist. <laughs> but either way, we are all in a place to advance something. What are you there to advance? And that's something I want you guys to chew on. Forgiveness is not about us. If Joseph had not forgiven his brothers, God's people would have starved because there was a famine in the land. For God's people to be saved, it was hanging on Joseph's forgiveness. Imagine that. Imagine that. There was a harsh famine in the land. These guys had no option but to go. J Jacob sent them, go to Egypt. We know that there are storehouses there. He didn't even know that the storehouses were created by his son. Don't you know that there's always a bigger picture that God is working at? If you step out of yourself, just for a minute, just step out of yourself. God, what are you doing here? I know that you'll never put me in a place to suffer without purpose. I know you won't. So God, what are you doing here? Part of I had a dream. And you guys know the dream. For seven years, there will be plenty for seven years. There will be famine. And Joseph helped him to interpret that dream. Joseph was called up, taken out of prison. And then he was in charge of making sure that there's enough food for the nation of Egypt. Guys, there was enough food for the nation of Egypt. This is too good to be true. There was enough food for the nation of Egypt not to starve. To a point where even other nations came asking for help. Simply because one man, one man was sold into slavery by his family members. Forgiveness has, ha, is greater than you. It is way greater than you. When we are compelled and we are asked to forgive, it's not for our comfort. 
the healing that can come into a nation simply because you chose to forgive. You have more degrees than Joseph had. You are more knowledgeable. <laughs> and look what God was able to do with a man who was willing to submit and forgive. Forgiveness is not, is not just about us. The question we need to ask ourselves is if we want healing in our land, if we want healing in our nation, what areas of unforgiveness are limiting healing that I am, what areas am, am, am I not engaged in of forgiveness that is limiting healing from coming into my society? When we say forgive family, we're not asking you to fix relationships, guys. It's bigger than that. It's bigger than that. All I ask is just step out of yourself and ask the kingdom, what am I involved in with you, God, that if I don't forgive, is going to be limited? In my workspace, you don't have to look far. In your workspace, in whatever area God has called you to, if I'm not a forgiving person, what will suffer here? Joseph, I'm sure, never thought that I'm going to be the governor of Egypt. People are going to ask me. God is going to give me the wisdom of an age to come to create systems that provide food for nations. What is God working in you if you just yield to him? How many Josephs are here? And that's the devil. That's the thing. The devil doesn't want you to do that. The devil just wants you to think about your debit orders and your rent and your insurance. He wants to keep you here. That's where he wants to keep you. School fees, rent, groceries. Who's cooking today? It's Sunday. That's where he wants to keep you. And I'm there. I dare you to ask for more. I dare you to ask for more. Nothing in the kingdom, guys, is supposed to make sense. If slaves can become governors, I mean, guys, if Richard can get a wife like I mean, guys, yes. huh? if you're still waiting for normality, you are in the wrong kingdom, guys. What are you, what, what is God doing in your life if you just step out of yourself? If you let go of that victim mentality, what is he working on? Every harsh trial that you are going through is for something. Joseph being in prison was for something. There is always a theme, whether you are being promoted or demoted, that carries you wherever you go. Some of you are good at creating wealth. Some of you are good at, at relational capital. Some of you are good at breaking down concepts. No matter where you are, whether you are, you are in varsity and you are failing dismally, whether you are in your workspace right now where you're being promoted, there's always been a theme that has followed you all your life that the devil doesn't want you to know. And if you take time to engage in that, the healing that will come in our nation, There's nothing stopping you from being a Joseph. Just forgive. It's bigger than you. It is bigger than you. We all entered through the gate of forgiveness. Our identity is attached to forgiveness. Let us stand. I think that's a good place to let things marinate. It's not by might, it's not by power. It's not by might, it's not by power, but by the Holy Spirit. Everything in the kingdom that is promised to us, we are empowered to do by the Holy Spirit. The things that do not make sense, <laughs> the areas of victory that do not make sense can only be empowered by the Holy Spirit. 
Lord, we ask that you take us to a place where we worship you, not because we're confused about whether we did it or not, but because we're just surrounded by the miracles of what you are doing that had nothing to do with us. Give us an appetite for things we don't deserve. Give us the courage to come boldly on your throne and say, Lord, we want that. We don't see it around us, but we want that. We know we don't deserve it, but we want that. We don't have the education for it, but we want that. We are dysfunctional. We are broken. We come from messed up pasts, but we want that. You have to be tenacious. The things, the promises that God has put in the kingdom, you have to be tenacious, nearly mad. You have, for some of the things you guys are trusting God for, you have to be crazy. So, be crazy. If you're still waiting for them to make sense, how long are you going to wait? We live in a realm where slaves can become governors. So Lord, we say, we say come Holy Spirit. There are hearts here, Lord God, that have stopped believing. There are hearts here that have been discouraged. There are hearts here that that, that have gotten to places where they've just been discouraged and have not, have not gotten what they felt that they needed and they've given up. So we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd come turn hearts that have been made into stone, make them into hearts of flesh. We are asking that you'd help people to believe again. We're asking, Father God, that you resurrect. Resurrect, Father God. What people are trying to kill, resurrect. And what people are trying to resurrect, we ask that you'd kill. We want to be aligned with what you are doing in our lives. We come against the spirit of discouragement right now in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of mundane right now in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of unforgiveness and hurt right now in the name of Jesus. We come against the spirit of a mediocre Christian life. That is not what you died for. And Lord, we come to that same door that you opened for us. We ask, Lord God, that you'd forgive and heal us. Heal us of those hurts. Heal us of that discouragement. Holy Spirit, right now, bring to memory, bring to memory certain plans, ideas that people have just buried simply because they're discouraged. We ask that you'd resurrect those in Jesus' name. If you can do it for Joseph, if you can do it for our brothers and sisters around us, you can do it for us. We say, come speak again. We say, come speak again, Lord. We say, come speak again, Lord. Come speak again, Holy Spirit. We come against a spirit of depression right now. Come speak again, Holy Spirit. Come do only what you can do. We want the life, Lord God. We want the life and the promise, Father God, that you died for. We say, come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Let's just wait on the Lord. Come Holy Spirit. 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 We say no to the words that we've spoken over ourselves. We say no over the, over the, the failure that we've accepted. Come Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit. Lord, I also come against a fatigue, a fatigue and a tiredness for people who don't want anything anymore. They've just given up. They're just living automated lives. Lord, we thank you. We speak, we speak to those hearts right now. There are some of you who are here who you are too tired to pray. You're too tired to pray. <laughs> Don't worry. God knows where you are at. You come to church because you just have to come to church. Your fatigue has gotten to a level where you can't wait for church to end so you can go back to your isolation. 
God knows you. And God wants to resurrect. God wants to resurrect. For those who say, I'm tired, Lord, I don't know what else to do. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Entry-level spiritual disciplines have become so hard for you to do, you've just given up. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. The same power that, ro that rose Christ from the dead is the same power that lives in us. So we say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. For some of you, God is even bringing up faces that you need to let go and forgive. Things about yourself that you need to forgive yourself so your heart can become a heart of flesh again. And don't be afraid. Just forgive. Just forgive. So you can be resurrected. Forgive. Come, Holy Spirit. 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 For those who are, I'm, those who are saying, I'm tired, Lord, I have no more options. Come, Holy Spirit. For those who are saying, Lord, I've been saved for many years and I feel like I haven't progressed anywhere. Come, Holy Spirit. I've been a Christian for 10 years, Lord Jesus, and I still feel like I'm just living an entry-level life. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I know you promised things, but I don't feel like I've gotten a grasp or I've lived out, I've lived out this life. Come, Holy Spirit. 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 Some of you are close to just even backsliding and just leaving God altogether. Some of you have already left God altogether. You're just doing functional things. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. We say, come, Holy Spirit. In your hurt, come, Holy Spirit. Some of you are in between. You're managing the tension of you are hurting, you feel betrayed, but you are still worshiping God. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Some of you are, are you feel forgotten. You feel forgotten. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing, Lord. Lord, help us to realign our identities with you, Jesus. Help us to realign our identities with you, Lord. We thank you that you are a forgiving God. And we thank you that you empowered us to be forgiving people. So we receive, we receive what you have for us, Lord. We receive what you have for us, Lord. We receive what you have for us, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. I'd just like to invite the prayer team up in the front for those who will be needing prayer after the service. And if you've been needing prayer, please feel free after the service to come up. For those who you don't have a relationship with Christ and you know that that is the one thing that is missing. And for those, for those, I feel like there's a large number of us that we've kind of reached, we've, re we've reached a ceiling of growth, a ceiling of intimacy with the Holy Spirit, simply because we've allowed unforgiveness to hold on to us. And God wants to minister to those people. So we say, come Holy Spirit, we thank you for what you are doing here this morning. We thank you, Lord God, for how you speak to each individual heart that is here. We thank you that you know them by name and you have a plan for their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God is in a good mood. <laughs> he is. All he wants, God is more invested in your freedom than you are. God is more invested in your purpose and destiny than you are. No matter how you feel about him, 
God is so secure in himself as a father that he can allow you to throw your toys around and still be him. Do you know why? Because he doesn't need you, but he wants you. You don't need to perform for him. He knows the areas of your heart that are dark, and all he wants is to make you come alive. When was the last time you enjoyed the benefits of being you? So Lord, we thank you, Lord God. You're going to begin to touch people this week. You are going to love on them in a way that you know how they receive it. Because you made us individually. We are wonderfully and fearfully made. And Lord, we thank you for healing. We choose to walk in it. We say yes and amen. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you so much, great people. Have a great week. The, our, our pastoral team and prayer team will be up here to pray for anyone who needs help um, with anything. And uh, have a great week.